Look at all these grapes. Witness the transformation of luscious grapes to wine, truly God's gift to man. Dinner without wine is like the day without sun. Wine has become an essential commodity for people around the globe. Let's travel to the world of wines and learn what makes them so attractive. The nation of art and culture, France. France is the country of the Eiffel Tower. The magnificent Arc of Triumph is standing in the middle of Paris. Notre Dame Cathedral considered the greatest masterpiece of Gothic-style architecture. And the Seine River running through Paris. But there's one other thing that we shouldn't forget to mention when it comes to France. It's the wine. Its profound taste and flavor make people come back for more and more. It's wonderful and romantic to be enjoying a glass of wine in this country of wine. It's great. When it comes to wine, people think of France first. A person consumes an average of 73 liters of wine each year in this country. Wine is a part of the French people's daily lives. The people's intimate relationship with wine in France is reflected in the fact that one in every 10 French works for a living in a wine-related business. As such, wine-related accessories are as popular as wine. Corkscrews, beautiful as jewelry, are one of the most popular items sought after by wine enthusiasts. The price of wines varies depending on the year of their production. But it doesn't necessarily mean the oldest wine is the most expensive one. Wine produced in a year of good harvest usually tastes better and is priced accordingly. Five hours of driving southeast out of Paris brings you to the region of Bourgogne. Along with Bordeaux, Bourgogne is the main center of wine production in France. This is a renowned winery in Burgoyne. Burgoyne wines are famous for their delicate and smooth taste. That's why they're called the queen of wines. Let me show you around. An old elevator. We went down to the cellar where the secrets of aging wine were hidden. The surrounding walls and ceiling were all made of thick stones. keeping wines in this stone-walled cellar at a temperature of 10 to 12 degrees Celsius and a 65% humidity throughout the whole year is the main secret of preserving the wine's taste. Uh, we have about 100,000 bottles of wine in the cellar. They range from very old ones to the most recent ones. Every bottle displays its year of production. While looking around the cellar, we came upon an unusual scene. In one corner, dusty wine bottles were stacked on top of each other. It looked like they haven't been touched in a very long time. What are these bottles? Uh, they're very old and no one knows exactly when they were produced. I'm pretty sure that they're more than a hundred years old. Many people can hardly believe these bottles actually have wine in them. You want to see if it's true? It was hard to see through the bottle which was covered with thick dust, but a careful look revealed that it really had wine splashing inside. People must see the bottle to believe it. <laughs> These bottles are a witness to our winery's past and history, so we keep them as treasures. Okay, let's go meet wines of the Republic of South Africa this time. 30 to 40 minutes driving out of the capital city of Cape Town takes you to Wineland the largest wine production center in the country. Many wineries and vineyards are concentrated in Wineland, and in Cape Town, there's even a place named after it. Along with France and Chile, South Africa is one of the major wine-producing countries. Our wines are in great demand, so we're extremely busy here. With only a 350-year-old history, South Africa is relatively a newcomer to the wine production scene. 
Despite that fact, the country is blessed with natural environments that are excellent for producing grapes. This country is flanked by both the cold current of the Atlantic Ocean and the warm current of the Indian Ocean. And such conditions brings the right amount of humidity, wind and sunshine for growing grapes. This is a winery in Wineland. Uh, fresh grapes from the vineyard are made into wine in this place. The first step in wine making is the extraction of grape juices. Huge amount of grapes getting poured into the machinery is quite a scene. Unlike the traditional European counterparts, South African wineries depend on automated systems to produce their wines. And there's also a big difference in the wine containers. In this country, wines are kept in stainless steel tanks instead of oak barrels. Uh, you can use oak barrels for only about three years, but stainless steel barrels last much, much longer. And this country produces large amounts of stainless steel. It's also good for preserving the wine's taste. The wine solution gets filtered once more in wine tanks. And a repeated filtering process brings the color and taste of the solution more and more closer to wine. At this stage, it's more like grape juice. It'll gradually become wine after time. The filtering process goes on for a week. In the making of quality wine, the temperature plays an important role. Uh, it's about right. We were told that the best wine temperature is 23 degrees Celsius. Constant tasting of the freshly produced wine is an important part of the job. South African wineries are focusing their efforts on producing wines that are richer in vitamin C. Mm. It has a very clean taste and nice flavor. <laughs> the extracted grape juice is first filtered in a wine tank. Then it is moved into an oak barrel for fermentation and aging. By the way, we noticed every wine barrel had a curious looking instrument on top of it. There are barometers that measure the progress of fermentation. Wine produces gas as fermentation takes place. You can measure the progress by looking at the air bubbles in the barometer. After fermentation, wines are put through an aging process of two to three years. If you want to experience South African wines more closely, there's a place to visit. A number of people have gathered here for a wine sampling session. In South Africa, you can take a variety of wine-themed tours. They all taste wine in earnest. Uh, this is my first time tasting South African wine, and I can say it's definitely different from the ones I'm used to. <laughs> Thanks to aggressive marketing efforts, South African wines have won many prestigious wine contests and gained a name for their high quality around the world. Because most good restaurants in this country produce their own wines, tourists can experience a variety of wines during their trip. Like Asians who eat their meals with water and tea, Westerners are used to drinking wine. It's the same in South Africa. From cheap wine in working people's cafes to high-priced ones in classy parties, wine is an integral part of their food culture. And when it comes to cooking, wine is something that chefs can't do without. One of the fine examples of cuisine using wine is a meat dish called bobotai. Uh, this is white wine. You need this wine to prepare bobotai. Considered an essential seasoning ingredient, wine brings out more flavor out of foods and makes them taste softer and smoother. When used in meat or fish fairs, wine helps to remove the distasteful smells as well as add more colors to the dishes. In the kitchen, wine surely goes beyond its concept as an alcoholic beverage to play a major role in deciding the taste and quality of a dish. Another country we shouldn't forget when talking about wine is Italy. This is Modena one of the famous wine-producing areas in Italy. Uh, you take over now. Uh, why don't you just finish it? <laughs> At a glance, the place looks like a gas station, but another look reveals that it's not the case. Oh, what a waste. It's overflowing. People in this town come here every week to get their wine. They drink wine like water every day. 
As it turned out, these were grape juice vending machines called Mosto. In this famous wine producing area of Medina, people get their weekly supply of grape juice and boil them at a 95 degree heat for 15 hours to use them as a replacement beverage for wine. It's fine. I like wine, but I like this boiled grape juice replacement too. It's good. The people here consume grape juice daily. The whole scene is enough to make you acquainted with the Italians' love of wine. In Italy, each region and province produces its own brand of wine with its distinct taste, flavor, and color. Medina is famous around the country for its sparkling wine. Let's see how sparkling wine is produced. Once inside the facility, big stainless steel wine tanks came into our view. Sparkling wine is made in a much shorter time than wine. If you add sugar and enzyme to fermented wine, the second fermentation takes place and bubbles are produced. You make sparkling wine by permeating the wine with those bubbles. The appropriate temperature for fermenting sparkling wine is around 17 degrees Celsius. The mark of sparkling wine is its sweet and biting taste with a lot of bubbles. A glass of cold sparkling wine with air bubbles rising up leaves a long-lasting impression on first-timers with its distinctive taste and flavor. Mmm. I like its biting feeling and smell. It's really unique. Regarded as the oldest medicine for men, wine is a gift from God. To wine lovers, a day without a glass of wine is like a day without the sun. For them, wine is an essential part of their lives. Thanks to people who endeavor to make wine more and better, the flavor of wine will continue to spread throughout the world. Let's meet interesting folks living in novel villages around Asia. Simple and happy lives of Kazakh village folks in the Mongolian grasslands and the tasty smell filled Li Chun Town in the Philippines, which is the most delicious place on earth. It's a simple life, but they're happy because they can be together. Let's travel to their villages. Mongolia on the Asian continent, it's a country of green grasslands and blue skies. We were told that there's an interesting village not far from the city. This is the simple-looking village of Nalahi. It's also called Kazakh village because folks here are nomadic people from Kazakhstan. The first scene we noticed as soon as we entered the village was a number of people standing in line with metal containers by their side. What's up? Why are you standing in line? Well, I came here to buy water. The villagers here buy their water at about two cents per container. This is a water-scarce place, and the folks can get their water only twice a day. In this village, the water tank is called Hodok. Moving water from the container to a home water tank is a daily routine for these folks. They do the job with great care as not to spill a single drop of their precious water. The thrifty way of life can be seen elsewhere in their daily lives as well. What's this hanging down on a wash basin? We put that there to save water. Precious water from a home water tank is only used a little when there's an absolute need. That's where this, a sort of portable wash basin called Ogature, comes in. Small drops of water may be tantalizing, but the Ogature is a product of a bright idea that saves scarce water. That's nothing to brag about. Come inside and I'll show you something real. Come this way. Uh, take a look over there. With the old lady's invitation, we took a look around the room and noticed carpets with lavish patterns. Grandma, did you make those carpets yourself? Of course. I made them all. From history, the women of Kazakhstan have been known for their delicate and talented hands and it shows all around the house. I usually embroider images of flowers, animals, and other things you can see in nature. They bring us good health and good luck. After a fascinating look around, we went out of the house to see a few village women busying themselves with something. Why have they taken out these fine-looking carpets to this yard? What are you doing, ma'am? 
We're preparing for a party. Every Friday we have a prayer meeting. Oh, a prayer meeting, I see. What about the white sheet? What is it for? In our village, this is the dinner table. Folks of the Kazakh village use a white sheet for the dinner table and jade green as a table's top covering. It's a bit foreign to us, but this manner of preparing the dinner table has been with these folks for a long time. It's called Dostarkhan. While village ladies prepare for a prayer meeting, village children all dressed up join the scene. Hey kid, you really look lovely. Did your mommy buy you new clothes? Oh uh, no, she made it for me. She said this is the traditional costume of our village. I don't usually wear this, so it's a bit uncomfortable, but it looks very nice. <laughs> so far, we were having a good time in the village, but there was something missing. It was the special fares for today's occasion. In the kitchen, ladies were busy preparing horse meat. Horse meat is a traditional delicacy. Our people always eat horse meat on special days. To the nomadic ancestors of Kazakh village folks, horse meat eaten on grassland was considered the best fare. Following the traditional manner of preparation, nothing is wasted. They boil everything, including the meat, bones, and internal organs for hours. The highly nutritious horse fare of Kazakh village is famous for its clean taste. Okay, the food is ready. Pretty maidens bring sumptuous looking horse fares to the tables. But there's one thing they don't forget to do before a feast. Since it's a prayer meeting before being a feast, the oldest man in the clan solemnly prays for all the other members. Even after the prayer, family members can start eating only when the clan chief cuts the meat and hands it out. Folks at Kazakh village are foreigners and a minority in this land of Mongolia, but they follow their own traditions and do their best to preserve their heritage. Uh, since we're living in Mongolia, we can't help but become assimilated to some degree. But we'll never forget our heritage and traditions. Such spirit keeps the folks here happy and proud in spite of the fact that they're living in a foreign land. I often do a traditional Kazakhstan dance so I won't forget it. This is how you do it. It's very fun. They lead a simple and humble life as a minority in Mongolia, yet they're happy because they know they're together. Let's go to the Philippines. More than anything else, the country is known for its pristine tropical beauty. Its seas are said to change color seven times a day. In the Philippines, we set again in search of a novel village. With curiosity, we first stepped into a famous restaurant. A quick look around revealed that every patron in the restaurant was having the same dish. What is the food that they are eating after dipping it in some kind of sauce? If you want to know, you should go to the town. It's really a delicious town. A delicious town? After asking around for the directions, we headed to the town, not too far from Manila. At a glance, nothing seemed so special about the place. But in a few minutes, we came across something unusual. The whole town was booming with traffic of roasted pigs being moved around. As it turned out, these roasted pigs were one of the most famous Filipino fairs called Lechon. Booming with people all year round, this town is known as Lechon Town. Lechon is widely favored by locals and tourists alike, and for their satisfaction, only the healthy pigs under the age of five months are used to prepare their fare. Well, I can buy lechons in other places, but although a bit bothersome, I always come here because this town makes the best lechons in the country. There is a certain place for everything. And people in this country come to this lechon town to buy lechon. From lechons being roasted to lechons being delivered to a destination. 
Gretchens are all over this town, and it must be a tough job for buyers to pick the best one out of so many. There's no worry. Just ask that man over there. He is the expert. He's right. There's nothing to worry about. Please tell us how to pick quality lechens. First of all, look carefully at the outside appearance of lechen. The ones that look good also taste good. Glossy skinned ones are better than ones with rugged skin. They're the ones that were not properly roasted. But mister, why do you walk off in the middle of the lesson? Well, it's only a short walk. I'll show you what I mean. We followed the man to a place where there was a pig hanging down the entrance. Inside, more than ten pigs were being roasted at once. This place is a legend factory. Being so popular and famous, a lot of work goes into preparation of these legends. Throughout the roasting process, sauce oil must be applied to each legend at constant intervals. Since the sauce oil is the source of legend's great taste, the ingredients and making of the oil is top secret. Also, good charcoals must be constantly brought up to surface for even distribution of heat and keeping lechins from being overburned. It really sounds like a tough job. Uh, that's really nothing. Look how it gets roasted. We didn't notice it at first, but the bamboo pole placed through a pig was being rolled by the man's hands. Hey, people, stop for a second and stand up. Surprisingly, on the other side of the wall, there were a bunch of people squatting down on the floor. They were there throughout the whole time rolling and roasting lechins behind the wall. Virtually everybody in this town has one time or another rolled and roasted lechins. Weather in this country is already hot and humid enough to make anyone sweat. Adding the heat of charcoal fire to the weather turns the whole place into a suffocating sauna. It's so hot in here, it's difficult even to talk. But I'm glad I have much work here. I'll do my best. Well, it's not an easy job, but I've done this long enough that I can manage it. I also feel proud that people are happy with the lections we roast here. Behind delicious lections, there were ordinary folks of this town sweating all day, working in suffocating conditions. Perhaps it's their sweat and efforts that have made this town's lections the best in the country. But because of the huge demand for lechins this town produces, work hands are always in need. To meet rising demand, some factories have adopted machinery, but for the most part, lechins in this town are still roasted in the traditional manner by hands. After two hours, the roasting of lechin is finished. And it is now ready to be sold or served to customers. The oily and glossy surface of lechin makes it look even more tempting. Uh, this one is messed up. L look at this. Who's going to buy this? It didn't look like a big deal to us, but the man points out the fault like the expert that he is. Freshly roasted lechins are usually sold in a matter of few minutes. After removing the bamboo pole, each part is cut and wrapped in separate cooking foil so the customer can easily carry them. But nothing beats tasty, freshly roasted lechon right on the spot. Mister, I can literally hear how delicious it is. Oh, it's heavenly. This town roasts the best lechons in the whole of the Philippines. <laughs> they live in a faraway foreign land, but their will to preserve their tradition and heritage makes them happy and proud. And there are people who work hard in adverse conditions to make their products the best in their country. The simple life will always go on. Talking about India without mentioning religion is meaningless. India is the land of the gods. Let's witness the unique customs of the Hindu religion and visit its temples and learn about strictly observant sheikhs who only comprise 2% of the Indian population yet have great influence over the society. Indians may worship different gods, but they're tolerant of other faiths. Let's meet the Indians who are one of the most religious peoples on earth. Home to one of the most ancient civilizations, India gave birth to Buddhism and Hinduism. 
It's not too much to say Indians are born with the religion. About 80% of the Indian population are Hindus. Perhaps because of such a fact, one comes across ascetics in the street very often. I've been in religious training for many years now. It's not an accident that we meet like this. There's something on the ground in the middle of the busy street. It's a flower-decorated statue of a god. It's pretty much a common scene in Indian cities. Passers-by often stop for a few minutes at such statues to burn incense. We pray for good fortune. Anybody can come up here and pray. This is another street in the city. What do street merchants sell in India? Among many displayed items, which is the most common item? They're the items depicting the images of Hindu gods. In the Hindu religion, there are 330 million different gods. I've got many different items here because each person believes in different gods. Why don't you buy this one? How much is it? Just give me $2. Uh, could you go lower than that? With $2, you won't be able to buy this anywhere else. Picking one can be a headache since there's so many gods to choose from. Oh, there are many gods, but each god looks different and has different abilities. In India, a ghat is a form of well-paved stairs that lead to the river. People can take a bath or even cremate bodies here. It's early morning and these ladies are on their way to the ghat to give their offerings to their god. They include coconuts, flowers, sugar and incense. Each time the offering can be different, but they're prepared with great care. What you bring is not as important as how sincere you are. I'm going to pray really hard. The ladies pick a spot overlooking the river to burn incense and pray. The scene looks foreign to us, but it's a part of their daily routines. While the ladies are engaged in prayer, boys stand and watch them from the side. By the way, hey kid, why are you taking your shirt off? What are you doing? I'm just waiting for their prayers to end. Just wait and see. You'll find out. After finishing with their prayers, the ladies throw their offerings into the river. When everything has been thrown, from coconuts to coins, the boys jump into the river. Hey boys, what are you up to? You may hurt yourself, but there's no need to worry. They're excellent swimmers and move like fishes in the water. The reason for their plunge is to collect the ladies' offerings. Hey boys, what are you going to do with those offerings? Boys usually go into water to get coins and coconuts. I got a coconut. This is all I got out of there. I'm going to dry this well and sell at the nearby marketplace. As it turned out, this was their way of making a small allowance. This is a Hindu temple in New Delhi. Around 9 a.m., the temple begins to bustle with worshippers. We wondered why people were waiting in line to get in. As it turned out, the temple guards were conducting a strict one-by-one -one security check. What kind of temple is this? We became curious, so we decided to give it a try. As we expected, a security guard blocked our entry. No, no. Strict security with a no camera rule. Hey, mister, can we at least ask you why? Read over there. No filming is allowed in and outside of this temple. Read carefully. A regulation panel at the entrance was saying exactly the same thing, and temple security was stern. Then where shall we leave our camera? Fortunately, there was a locker room at one side of the temple entrance. They took only cell phones and cameras and kept them for visitors until they leave. They thoroughly search visitors to see if they have phones or cameras. It's a little inconvenient, but it's the rule, so I just follow it. Many Hindu temples forbid cameras, but this temple is even more strict. I think you can find some temples which do not have such a rule. After a lot of searching, we were able to find a Hindu temple which did not forbid filming of their rituals. The Hindu religion is a polytheistic faith, but there exists Shiva and the Supreme God. Other than that, different Hindu temples have their own different gods for worship. The Brahmins, the highest class of people in the Indian caste system, bless visitors and paint bindi on their forehead or hand out holy waters. For Indians, there's not much distinction between the sacred and secular life. Religion is an integral part of the people's daily lives. I was born a Hindu, and I'm a Hindu now, and I'll always be a Hindu. There's one common scene in Hindu temples. Ring ding! Ring ding! You see people ringing bells all the time. Why are there so many bells? It must not be that part of all decorations in the temple. By ringing bells, we let our God know that we have come to worship him. 
It's like asking God, may I enter your home? You ring the bell very politely. <laughs> Walking in the streets, there are some people who stand out in their manner of dress. These are people wearing a turban on their head. But you should not confuse them with Muslims. They're Sikhs. Besides their turbans, Sikhs can easily be recognized by other parts of their appearance. Their religious law forbids haircuts and shaving. If you're still confused, just look at the man's side. The dagger at his side is the symbol of all Sikhs. All Sikhs carry this type of dagger. We carry it always, even when we eat or sleep. We never let it go from our body. If they always carry the dagger... Do you ever take off your turban? Oh, we can never do that. Never. The turban is a symbol of the Sikh, and it's like a natural part of my body. I can never take off my turban. Never. No way. The turban is a symbol of being perfect, but not every Sikh believer actually wears a turban. For believers not wearing a turban, the temple prepares scarves for them. Approaching God without something covering their head is considered impolite. You should cover your hair like this. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Our scripture commands it. Sikhism is a crossbred religion of Islam and Hinduism, and has very strict laws. Besides covering their head with a turban or scarf, believers are required to take off their shoes and socks before they enter the Sikh temple. I don't mind at all. Of course we should take off our shoes. They're dirty! Then what do you do with all the socks and shoes taken off by the people? In the temple, there's a place that holds people's shoes for them. In a matter of a few minutes, the shoe cabinets are filled with thousands of shoes. Taking shoes in and bringing them out, the people inside busy themselves in service of their brethren's waiting outside. Of course, these men are all volunteers who devote much of their daily lives to their religion. Anyway, to get their shoes back, they must have a number tag. What happens if a guy loses his by accident? If you lose the tag, you have no option other than walking back home barefoot. By the way, how many pairs of shoes could the shoe cabinets in this place hold? Looking like an endless labyrinth, we were told the cabinets here can hold 5,000 pairs of shoes. The custom of taking off shoes is a result of Islamic and Hindu influence. The act symbolizes an act of getting oneself clean by detaching unclean articles from one's body. Because we have number tags, we can manage things here pretty well. Take a look. In the Sikh religion, a shoe cabinet means something more than just a shoe cabinet. Sitting between cabinets on the floor, the man is doing something that looks quite strange. Using a filtering dish, the man collects sands from people's shoes and then puts them in small bags. We rub these sands on our clothes or on our forehead. Sometimes we mix them in the water we drink. What does he mean by that? Okay, here it is. Swallowing sand is an expression of repentance. Putting the sand in separate small bags is to hand them out to people who need the sand for similar purposes. Sikhism was founded in the Punjab province during the 16th century. They comprise only 2% of the Indian population, but they're the wealthiest group in the country. Unlike polyistic Hinduism, Sikhs believe in only one supreme god. In this religion, anyone can become a priest, and discrimination based on class or gender is virtually absent. The Sikh religious law strictly forbids drinking and smoking, and stresses on aesthetic lifestyles and ethics. Uh, our religion forbids many things, but I don't have any trouble following the laws. Everyone is equal in Sikhism. I like the idea very much. After the service, people are going somewhere in crowds. It's a mess hall where lunch is provided for temple members. In a few minutes, the place is booming with people. Anyone can come here and eat. This hall handles 3,000 people per hour. Regardless of one's faith, anyone can come here to receive a free lunch. Because of the large number of people, the menus are generally kept simple. I come here from time to time to get a free lunch. Today's menu is traditional Indian fare, curry and warm bean porridge. People like this menu. Before the food gets cold, volunteers move in a hurry for speedy distribution. Another traditional Indian fare provided is chapati. Here are well-baked chapatis. When everyone in the mess hall receives the main menu in chapati, a prayer of gratitude begins.
prayer is over, and now it's time to eat. Oh, by the way, is it good? Yes, I like it. Eating out a plate is definitely a virtue. It looks like the man must have been pretty hungry. Of course, you should eat everything up to the last bean. The meal is delicious and wholesome, too. While others eat, these volunteers wash plates on the other side of the mess hall. First, they clean up plates with their hands and then wash them with water. Washing all these plates is a lot of work, but I'm happy to see them enjoying their meal. I feel like I'm full already. Hinduism is the religion of the majority of Indians, and Sikhism is a faith of benevolence and charity for all people. Religion will continue to play a central role in the lives of the Indian people. Tales of fairs that are pleasing to the mouth as well as to the eyes. From the number one food street in Osaka, Don Tombori. And where traditional tastes coexist with a trendy atmosphere to a cozy and comfortable pub with familiar music playing in the background. Let's travel to Japan and enjoy the great fairs of Osaka. This is Don Tombori Street in Osaka, dubbed as the World Kitchen. The place is famous for many large-sized restaurant signs that capture people's eyes with their movement. Don Tombori is located in the heart of Osaka, with a daily mobile population of a staggering 2 million. There's a saying Tokyo will crumble because of its zeal for fashion and Osaka for its zeal for food. Osaka is a city known for its most famous fairs in Japan. One of them... This is the dish that comes up in my head when I'm hungry. Once you have it, you'll beg for more. You want to check it out? We introduce the first fair of the Don Tobori dishes. Our curiosity and expectation blown to full size by great looking dishes in the display and colorful posters at the entrance. We at last stepped into the restaurant. Welcome. The restaurant was already booming with patrons when we walked in. One of the reasons for the restaurant's popularity has been the kind service provided by its owner. Thanks to his personal efforts, the place has been very successful, especially with foreigners. The number one menu in this restaurant is Okonomiyaki. It's a wholesome traditional Japanese pancake. Let's hear from patrons how good it is. It's really good. This is my third visit to this restaurant already. Oh, it's very special. Taste it for yourself. Now I'm going to make Okonomiyaki. The main ingredient is wheat flour paste mixed with a bit of whipped cream. To the paste, lettuce is added. Also, a good amount of crunchy fried bits are added. Next, reddish green peppers are added to whet the customer's appetite. After egg is added, the whole paste is mixed thoroughly. This ends the first stage of preparation. It's time to grill the paste on a hot plate. First sold in 1940, Osaka Okonomiyaki spread to all parts of Japan and became hugely popular because of its ample size and cheap price. Ever since then, it has been one of the ordinary people's most beloved fairs in Japan. When the paste is cooked, a variety of Okonomiyaki sauce is added. Lastly, shreds of dried Oceanic Bonito are put on the finished Okonomiyaki. The taste of the sauce and the taste of okonomiyaki are in perfect harmony. Don't forget to try it when you're in Osaka. On the Dontonbori Street, people are standing and looking at something with great interest. What are they looking at? I was taking its picture. It's so famous, you know. It's the most exciting place in the city. Heavenly Mall is the second attraction of Osaka we would like to introduce. The building is occupied by a variety of themed food courts and restaurants from the 5th to 7th floor. The place attracts thousands of customers each day. This place has a unique way of doing business with its customers. This is an IC card. You shop with this card while you're in the mall and you pay the total amount recorded in this card when you exit. Mm-hmm, the idea sounds very original, but that's not all. The interior of the Heavenly Mall is a recreation of a food street in Osaka 100 years ago. 
Old streets and shops appeal to the sense of nostalgia Japanese people have, but the mall is also quite popular with foreign tourists. And the mall is filled with many eye-catching features. Frequent staging of a variety of shows and performances is another attraction of the Heavenly Mall. Also, many food courts and restaurants put on their own shows to attract customers. It's one strange looking instrument. You like the sound though, right? Yes, it was very nice. It feels like I've traveled back in time. This place is full of interesting features. There's one place in the mall that attracts even more customers than others. This is a special place. You have to be very quiet. The narrow corridors are occupied by a series of mystics. This is the fortune teller's alley. In this alley, a group of fortune tellers with different talents read good and bad fortunes for customers. We were told that this alley is quite useful in blowing away stress and worries. Don't worry too much. You're going to meet a good man soon. <laughs> really? I guess I'll be getting married to someone before the new year. Wherever there are crowds of people, there must be snacks as well. In this mall, there are around 50 restaurants, food courts and snack bars with a wide variety of menus. One of the most popular menus is Osaka's own takoyaki. It's the menu everybody loves. The quick movement of the man's hands is indeed worthy of the snack bar's reputation. You want to see the making of original takoyaki? Takoyaki is not terribly complicated to make. First, wheat flour paste is poured onto a frame plate. Bits of sweet pepper and grinded shrimps are sprinkled onto the paste. Besides octopus, a variety of different ingredients are used. Takoyaki, too, was first made in Osaka. The important trick of making takoyaki is fast flipping of takoyaki balls in succession. As soon as one side is cooked, the other side is rolled down with long pins. At the end, well-cooked takoyakis are taken out and added with sauce and bits of oceanic bonitos before serving. In the meantime, self-service takoyaki is also quite popular. According to their own taste, people can make takoyakis with ingredients of their own choosing. They can enjoy good snacks and also have fun in making them. What does your takoyaki taste like? We really did it like amateurs, yet they taste so good. <laughs> there is another native to Osaka restaurants that is regarded as one of the best in all of Japan. This noodle house restaurant has 200 years of history. The secret of success of this noodle house lies in their special chewy noodles and fresh seafood. Also, the thick soup made from boiling oceanic bonito for a long time is legendary. Our secret is in the noodles we use. The most important factor in noodle soup is, of course, the noodles. In this house, they mill their own wheat flour and use the product to make noodles. Also, they don't use artificial seasoning in their noodle soup. Instead, they try to bring out the natural taste of each ingredient they use. The only thing left is to boil the whole combination. After boiling, the famous seafood special noodle soup of Mimi Wu House becomes ready to be served. For a long time, this noodle house restaurant in Osaka has been serving the best seafood special noodle soup in Japan. Mmm, it's so chewy that it feels like the noodles are dancing in my mouth. <laughs> But our story is not over yet. Although there are restaurants which do their utmost to produce new tastes, some specializes in preserving tastes from the past. Welcome. Welcome. Specializing in old Japanese dishes, this restaurant strictly sticks to the traditional method when it comes to preparing the old dishes. The first menu they recommend was an uncurdled tofu dish. It's a fare which is supposed to be prepared on the patron's table. This is Japanese health food. It's especially good for people who lose appetite during summertime. It's a dish made of smooth, uncurdled tofu, which is very rich in protein. This dish is supposed to be eaten with salty and sweet soy sauce. Mm. It's so soft. 
It literally melts in your mouth. The most famous menu of this restaurant is the fresh raw fish dish. Indeed, the dish looks very tempting. They use only the freshest seafood for their dishes. To the ingredients, they add their traditional methods and techniques to bring out the best taste in the dish. And such efforts draw more and more customers. Hey, mister, how do you like the dish? I've eaten lots of raw fish, but this dish tastes so different that it makes me feel like I've never had any real raw fish dishes. Then let's step into the kitchen and see what makes this restaurant so special. Okay, I'll prepare an eel dish, which is one of the most popular items in this restaurant. To preserve the freshness, the chef usually goes right into preparing the fish as soon as he gets the order. After cutting open a one meter long eel with one sweep, the chef makes many cuts on the eel to make its meat tastier and the meat is cut to suitable size for eating. And then chunks of meat are scalded on boiling water until shreds begin to fall off. Next, the meat is moved off to ice-cold water to make it chewier. Uh, only flower-shaped chunks are picked out of these for serving. Japanese people consider eel as one of the best health foods around. After adding some decorations, the traditional Japanese dish of eel becomes ready to be served. Meanwhile, there's a place in Osaka famous for its large number of regular customers and friendly atmosphere. They can care less about their pants and shoes getting soaked in heavy rain. Oh, this place is very popular as you can see. After work, people always stop by here for drinks or snacks before they go home. This is a pub in Osaka well known for its friendly and easy atmosphere. This is the place where ordinary folks can relax and share their stories of the day over a couple of drinks. The popular menu here is coal roasted internal organs of pig or cow. Menu? It's really simple and there's not much here. I just choose that day's menu depending on what I have. This pub has been here for 50 years. It was passed down to the current owner by his father. As such, taste of foods here hasn't changed. Although being a tiny pub with little choice of menu to offer, the pub has been a favorite of people in the neighborhood. By the way, one thing in this pub caught our eyes. Hey, mister, what is that? It's a mini-sized wash basin. As you can see, this is a very tiny pub, so everything here is mini-sized. But like that restroom, I have here pretty much everything that people need. Though the interior is simple, it satisfies the regulars. Skipping this pub even for a day makes me feel empty. Coming here every evening is a part of my life. His regulars are from the old generation, and this is a perfect place to share their nostalgia. It's like being in an old friend's home. I feel really comfortable here. Perhaps it was due to the old regulars that the owner of this pub succeeded in preserving the old taste that made this place so beloved. With their own distinct brand of taste and unique promotional efforts. The food street in Osaka will continue to flourish to the joy of many Japanese people.